I like when they group Larry DeMarco and PJ Orsini together. You get the complete Italian sponsorship break. <laughs> and then you introduce like a Katie Wilkes delegate and you're just home. Is, is what is what happens with that. So uh, Julie Abel came in yesterday, and she brought me a bottle of wine. One of, she had, had texted me, uh, pretty sneaky of her, by the way, but quite uh, quite clever. She asked me what my favorite Chianti was, and I was thinking she was going to try to sample it herself, but instead she brought it in for me as a gift yesterday. All right. And then she told me about this movie on Netflix called The Feast of the Seven Fishes, which if you're Italian, you know all about. Mm-hmm. I don't need to go into any further detail, but for those of you who are not Italian, uh, you probably should look that one up on Netflix. I watched it last night, and my favorite scenes, it's its like a rom-com kind of, but my favorite scenes were the uh, uncles were all together in the kitchen, uh, bossing each other around, cooking the fish. and it, was, it just was hysterical, and it reminded me a lot of being a kid. So I highly recommend it. Do you know where that movie was filmed? Fairmont and Morgantown. Reevesville. Reevesville's outside Fairmont. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. As you can imagine, my husband's a big fan. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> they, they shot it in 2018. And uh, there's uh, some big name actors in it too. There's uh, at least uh, three of them that I've seen before in other roles. Two of them were on The Sopranos together, and uh, they they fit in nicely. Now the one thing I have an issue with, though, Katie, is what color are your eyes? Green. Green. Okay. So uh, the kid, who's like the ba- the main character in the movie, is Italian. His dad has dark hair and dark eyes, but the kid has a lighter complexion and blue eyes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a little problem with that because that's just that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen too often in just, Italian families. I'm just going back to the uh, Italian theme movie with some of the actors from The Sopranos in it. How did they? Uh... How did oh, they yeah. come up with that? Uh, Joe Pantoliano, who played Ralphie Soprano. Oh, I like him. And Carmine Lupertazzi Jr. Uh, is uh, Fr- uh, Frank Abruzzi, uh, I think his name Not is. Not to be confused with Car- Carmine Lepitopsi, what? Se- Carmine mm-hmm. Lupertazzi Sr. Lupertazzi mm-hmm. Jr. Carmine yes. Lupertazzi Jr. So the guy that played Carmine Lupertazzi Jr., isn't it? Hey, I got to say, um, Katie brought us some homemade chocolate chip cookies, mm-hmm. and I ate three quarters of one before we got started. They are amazing. Thank you. It is it is the day of food. We have <laughs> we have cookies. We have uh, Pastor Tim brought donuts. Matt has rum cake. This is... Um, I think Jason's bringing Tudor's business. Jay, this, is not a, <laughs> this is not a good day for, for our arteries. I heard that on the way. I don't think... I don't know that I can compete with Tudor's, but I, I know... Um, I, from listening to your program enough, how much you all appreciate people who come bearing gifts. So. Oh, yeah. no, there's, there's nothing better in this world than homemade chocolate chip cookies. There's no question it's about a, it's it. A, we go easier on the guests who feed us. It's it's oh. always been known. It's We don't hide that fact. I mean, you don't have to say it out loud, though. I, it's well known. It's, 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 it's pretty yeah, much we, don't, we don't hide it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and Katie, no need to apologize. I think when you came in, you said, oh, I only brought chocolate chip cookies because of the other abundance that's on the table mm. every donation helps mm. yes <laughs> <laughs> remember there are no small roles just small actors that's all yes <laughs> uh katie though on a serious subject uh the reason why you are here is because we had gotten to some discussions of uh, domestic violence and uh subsequent issues that uh take place after a, an act of domestic violence and your office is obviously involved in prosecuting those cases Yes, I was initially hoping to come on with um, Katie Spriggs from the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center. Mm -hmm. She unfortunately was not able to be here today, but I know would be willing to uh, come on herself and and talk about the um, support side of things from all of the work that they do, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, But just there's been, obviously I can't comment on the specific cases but there's been a good bit of discussion of domestic violence in the news recently and so I wanted to talk both about what happens in the court system and I guess some of the markers to look for when it comes to lethality Mm -hmm. Um, so domestic violence is obviously a, a huge issue that we take very seriously and when it comes to my office um it's normally, it's oftentimes charged as a domestic battery or domestic assault. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk about and make sure everybody's aware of is that, and I've, I've talked about this on the program before, everyone is entitled to a bond in West Virginia unless you are charged with murder or kidnapping. So everyone who's charged with domestic battery is entitled to have a bond set. 
However, there can be special terms on those bonds, um, no contact provisions where the person who's charged is not permitted to have any contact with the victim. And if law enforcement sees them having contact, that is both a bond violation and a new crime, and they can take them forthwith and incarcerate them immediately, which is something that they can't necessarily do if there's a bond condition and they see somebody violating that condition. They, The normal process in a, a case that's not domestic is they provide us with an affidavit, we file a motion, there's a process to go through to get there. But I think because of the inherent danger of these sorts of crimes, the legislature recognized that and made it so that this is something where law enforcement can take them immediately. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of talk about that process and the importance of those no contact provisions in uh, bail agreements. Okay. When you say no contact, is that specific physical in seeing someone, or does that include text, emails, those types of things? It includes text and emails. And there's um, different magistrates and judges will word it differently, but our preferred way of wording it is no direct or indirect contact, meaning mm -hmm. that if I'm not allowed to have contact with you, I can't then message Rob and ask Rob to have contact with you mm -hmm. on my behalf. That would also be a violation. What about a Facebook post where I'm just ranting about my wife or my girlfriend and I'm, I'm upset and I'm just laying it all out there how much I don't like this person and would do damage if I could or whatever? Does that would be um, pretty fact specific to see if there are actual threats being made, okay. if it's not directly reaching out to that person. All right. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that's that's something that's important for everyone to know. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is the um, dangerousness and lethality assessment guide. It's uh, we call it the DLAG for short. Um, it was developed, I believe, in 2017. Um, I can send it to Rob, and it's also something that's available. Um, if you Google it, you can find it online. But there's a West Virginia-specific guide for all people involved in um, the system, including um, law enforcement, prosecutors, magistrates, judges, um, advocates. And it goes through what statistically is shown to um, be a marker of lethality with domestic violence. So it's something that I find incredibly helpful in evaluating cases for prosecution, but I think is also helpful for victims to understand. What are some markers um, of lethality? What, what, explain what that even means. So if you're looking at a relationship where there's domestic violence occurring, um, there are certain behaviors that are statistically shown to be potentially lethal. There's a list. There's um, what they refer to as researched indicators of highly dangerous or potentially lethal behaviors, and that includes possession, access, and use of weapons, uh, direct threats to kill, stalking behavior, strangulation, um, intrusive coercive control, which means like monitoring and controlling daily activities, um, forced intercourse, um, if the victim has left or is attempting to leave the relationship, um, if the offender is unemployed, if the victim has a child who's not the offender's biological child, if there's been escalating violence or concerns about substance use disorder. And a number of these are things that in an isolated scenario wouldn't necessarily be cause for concern, but taken together um, can be markers for um, potential escalation into a lethal situation. So those markers are on a form that law enforcement is required to fill out with the victim whenever they have uh, domestic violence, um, whenever they respond to that situation. And then it goes, it's attached to the police report and is part of our file and is something that, you know, we evaluate in a number of ways in what services we can assist in providing to the victim, which, like I mentioned before, most often is through um, EPIC. They, they can do amazing things mm -hmm. to, to help people um, get out of these situations, but it's also, you know, in looking at um, charges and potential sentences from our side of things. And it's something that's, that's pretty indicative. You know, we've had, I've had Katie uh, from Epic testify in a number of trials now, and in the last one, she brought in and reviewed the, um, the DLAG and also um, the power and control wheel. And I wish she was here to talk more about that, but it's a similar tool that, mm -hmm. um, that kind of goes through behaviors that you can look to to um, determine what's going on in a, in a relationship. 
Um, and the, the sad thing is, you know, the last trial we used her in was a murder trial, you know, and it, it's shown that there were just checks uh, looking at the, the evidence we had of the prior relationship that um, nearly everything on the DLAG would have been checked off by that victim. This, this strikes me as almost being similar to some of the gun violence stories we hear where the person maybe had been in and out of a mental health institution, maybe had shown signs that uh, they were, there were some issues, and then they commit the act, and then we read afterward that all these things were missed. So what's the solution to finding a way to prevent these things before they happen when people are showing signs? It usually, the the last case that I had, the um, the murder case, was a little bit of a different scenario. It was um, the victim in that case was male, and I think there's a lot of stigma about coming forward that he was concerned about, so he didn't necessarily um, reach out and uh, have her charged in, in, earlier on in the relationship. But the idea behind this is um, for the system to identify these lethal markers before it gets to that point. That's the whole, I guess, point of the dangerous and lethality assessment guide is to give everybody the tools to look for what could lead to lethality and do everything we can to stop it from getting there. What do you, um, do you guys do a lot as far as getting this, uh, this checklist out in just in society in general? I mean, are there, is it easy to find? Is there, is there some kind of a, I mean, to say like a marketing campaign, because this sounds amazing. I mean, because if, as you think about all of these different things and how they all, they all connect together. Well, it's really a, a tool that was developed for the court system and for advocates, um, but it it struck me um, because I find it so helpful in evaluating cases when y'all were talking, I guess, last week about um, domestic violence on the radio. And there was some, I think, conversation on your feed about, you know, markers and that we all need to be looking out for people that um, in the community that this was a good way to educate the community about uh, w what to be looking out for. Well, because I mean, I would think someone who's who's inside a relationship like this, who is who is being abused and controlled, it, it's sort of hard to look at the overall picture when you're inside it. But all of a sudden, if you're inside the relationship and you see this checklist and you go, "Yep, he's doing that. Well, he's doing. Well, oh, he's doing. Yep, he's doing uh, all of these seven out of eight. And it sort of it sort of may may help some people wake up and say, wait a second, I am in this situation. I can't keep saying, no, 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 he's a good guy. You know, it's he's just got some issues. And all of a sudden, you see all these. I mean, I I, I think getting that out in front of of more of more people would would really would really help. And I can send that to Rob. And also, I want to note that um, Epic has a lot of resources available on their. Um, website and if you call them they they do so much because it, it is a dangerous situation and it, I mean as you notice one of the markers is the victim has left or is trying to leave the relationship and so um, epic has um, has advocates who can help develop a safety plan and provide support and a place to go if anyone finds himself in that situation and is ready to leave how does it work if you have a situation like you mentioned, this gentleman who maybe you know was a little fearful, I, I don't want people to think I'm weak or whatever, so I'm not going to put that out. Yet you've got family and friends who are looking at a situation and recognizing some of those markers. The legal system can can you get involved because a family or friend comes and says, "Hey, I've got a a sister, a brother, a cousin, a relative who I think is in a dangerous situation," or does it have to come directly from that person in that situation? That's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, um, something needs to happen for law enforcement to be called to the house and observe domestic battery or domestic assault, and then um, there are. A lot of cases where we recognize that um, the victim's not necessarily ready to cooperate with prosecution, but it's a really dangerous situation, and um, we do what we can in the court system to um, put safeguards in place or prosecute without the victim's cooperation. So that might be why, when you hear about cases that um, end up with a um, lesser results, some sort of deferred adjudication or something like that, but with um, Batter's intervention program, Community Alternatives to Violence, which I also should have led with is an amazing program and 
um, is utilized in nearly every domestic battery or domestic assault case that, you know, the first mm -hmm. offense. Um, so there are things that we can do to try to put some supervision on the offender or, or do something to try to intervene um, even when the victim's not necessarily ready to fully okay. cooperate or maybe afraid to fully cooperate with a prosecution. Got a text from Sheriff Harmon a moment ago. He's talking about ankle bracelets and with for some of these no contact orders that go out uh, mentioning that the staff of the sheriff's department specifically, it's difficult to keep up with all these people who are under no contact orders. Do they issue ankle bracelets uh, as, a, as a matter of course for people who have those orders so we know that they're not going in back uh, anywhere near their, their spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend? No. Um, the way that works is if there is a no contact provision with um, someone, they may be placed on, there's two forms of monitoring for home confinement. There's home confinement monitoring where you are um, required to um, stay in your residence. And then there's um, GPS monitoring where they know where you are and you can have what's called zones of exclusion. Um, if you go within a zone of exclusion, which might be a victim's residence, um, then that notifies the home confinement officer because home confinement isn't monitored by the sheriff's department. It's monitored by the Berkeley County Home Confinement Program. Mm -hmm. And when that occurs, um, home confinement can contact law enforcement to take them forthwith. Normally, if somebody's on, it's a confusing distinction and why I generally prefer strict home confinement monitoring over GPS only because um, home confinement can arrest an offender um, on home confinement, strict home confinement monitoring for any violation. But if it's GPS only, it requires law enforcement assistance. But um, we've I've worked with home confinement with our um, sheriff's department, with our deputies and also with our um, city police to be aware of um, that the home confinement will need their assistance in those scenarios. And um, it's been my experience that they've had a, a good working relationship. In another couple of weeks, the legislature will go back in session for a new 60-day session. I think January 6th is the day that they begin. Is there anything that they can do or pass that would help make the prosecutor's job easy or easy, easier or more efficient in these cases? And generally, when you laugh at me when I'm halfway through a question, I'm thinking, no, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, that's something I think you said Senator Barrett was going to be on yes. later. He, he's been very proactive in. Um, he was on the board of Epic for a long time. Yes. Um, so it's, it's something that I know he's he's worked at um, making sure that um, the legislature is doing everything they can. And they've they've done a lot in the past years. They've. Um, worked on making sure the definition of um, strangulation um, that there's a it's a felony to strangle someone and that's I important hope so. well you, you know the, the difference between misdemeanor and felony can be interesting sometimes um, mm. so uh, strangulation is essentially blocking um, air or causing bodily injury by you know placing hands around their neck um, and that is something that um, was made a felony in large part because it's a marker of lethality. And so it's something that we want to take more seriously. So that's something that the legislature assisted in um, first passing and then refining and tweaking the language somewhat. Is there anything so, else that they can further refine or tweak that you'd like to see them do? There's nothing that comes to mind immediately. Um, they've, I think, really, uh, in terms of uh, domestic violence, there's... Um, plenty of other things that I think the Prosecutors Association will be active in asking for. But um, with this, I think that um, they've worked hard to make sure that we have the the tools we need to do the best we can in in these scenarios. And in, in the pie that makes up all the cases that a prosecutor and then later the courts will see, what percentage of these cases, how big of the pie is made up of these kind of cases? That's a difficult question to ask without, and, and one that I should have um, I should have looked up before coming here to um, to better answer. Um, I think that it's, I mean. If you had to guess. I'll, I'll put it this way. I pretty much every time I cover magistrate court, there's at least one domestic battery or domestic assault on the docket, and we have magistrate court running every day. So, Do um, these cases oftentimes overlap or go concurrently with issues of foster care for children and uh, child abuse cases? Um, well, yes, because generally by its nature, child abuse is domestic abuse. So 
um, oftentimes if there is child abuse charged, there will also be domestic battery or domestic assault charged. Uh, in specific, I, mean, I guess I, meant, I didn't phrase that properly, but in a situation where one spouse or relationship uh, if with adults has gone in this direction, does it oftentimes also include the children? I understand what you're saying. Um, yes, I think that's something that can occur. Um, and also, if there is, uh, if there are children in the home when domestic battery or domestic assault occurs, um, then law enforcement's um, required to make a referral to Child Protective Services, and they are required to investigate that. But yes, it's sort of like um, how animal abuse is known to be a precursor to um, domestic abuse. Uh, I, I think that it, it goes hand in hand um, a lot of the time. Matt? Is there a specific set of guidelines as far as, you know, um, as a case would go through, um, you know, certain sentences, say, for domestic battery and or assault that, you know, might take that that perpetrator out of that situation or home and help to protect uh, the victim or victims for, you know, they know, hey, look, they're going away for so many years for whatever's been done and I don't have to worry for at least that period of time. So, yes, um, depending on what the sentence ends up being, and I'm going to say uh, I can understand the immediate, immediate response being why would a person who is abusive to their spouse get probation? Uh, so before I say that, I want to say I recognize that, and it's um, oftentimes because there's an issue with moving forward with the case, but we want to obtain a conviction and um, put something in place to help protect the person. And that could be, like I said, um, community alternatives to violence, the batter's intervention program, or no contact provisions. And if they're found to be in violation of that, then they can be revoked and they go to jail for the, um, the sentence that was suspended for probation. Otherwise, for domestic battery or domestic assault, those are misdemeanor offenses. They're um, jail sentences. So um, it's never going to be more than a year, which practically means about six months. But um, you can get, you know, more than one count would in would uh, at, end up being more than more than one sentence. And um, one other thing I should note: one of the reasons why we um, do what we can to get a conviction, even if it means we have to give something up and. Um, utilize probation or something like that is because domestic battery and domestic assault are enhanceable offenses. The third offense is a felony and comes with prison time instead of jail time. So that's something that we look at when we're making a determination of what to do with the case. It also, I mean, it puts something on the record where they, where as it escalates or if they have other issues or if they're in other relationships, then when you go to charge them again with something else, unfortunately, there, there's a record of it. It's not a first offense anymore. It, it makes it easier, I guess, to, to help to protect the person that they're abusing. It does. And it also affects um, firearms rights. And we know that's not necessarily in every case going to be dispositive of whether someone obtains a firearm, but it can at least make it harder for someone who is known to be violent and has committed an act that causes them to to give up that right. Does a does a misdemeanor uh, domestic violence conviction does that keep you from owning a firearm at this point in West Virginia? It makes it uh, yes, it it does. Okay, yeah. I have a question for you from our website uh, from our from a Facebook page. Katie it has nothing to do with what you just discussed. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but it's from Damon Wright. Can you ask Katie why families were not or if families affected by the aid abuse were consulted regarding dropping charges? That, I guess that was a story last week. Yes. Or week before. Um, yes. And in, up until the end, we were in communication with the families. We um, did not agree with the parents of one of the victims. But I would say if you look at the order that the judge signed where – he reviewed all of the reasoning. I, I would just stand on what's set forth in, in the order that, that was signed by the judge. Uh, next question from Jeff Haddix. Does the prosecuting office have any role in removing guns from someone who has an FPO? No, um, that is up to law enforcement to go out and enforce. However, if there is a violation of that FPO, that becomes criminal. And the final thought is yours, Katie Wilkes-Delegate. 
I want to um, thank you for the opportunity to appear and talk more about this. I, I understand it's a heavy subject so close to Christmas, but because it is prevalent so close to Christmas and something that's been of concern in our community, and I just want to assure um, everyone, and I should have started out with this, that our law enforcement, our local law enforcement is um, doing an amazing job. They are incredible uh, showing up and um, putting themselves in what are known to be the most lethal situations for law enforcement to protect victims and to enforce the laws. And I just want to say that I'm incredibly thankful for our, our deputies and police officers and troopers for, for what they do every day. And Berkeley County should be proud to have them. Katie, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Katie Wilkes-Delegetti, prosecuting attorney.